So getting ready for exams at Brock University, uh, I want to start by sharing some of the things we can consider across all of our options. And that our remote conditions. So we are all uh, spread across the uh, globe as it were right now. Um, we have very little assurances of the actual conditions that students are writing in. Um, but the interesting thing about that is the conditions our students find themselves in is actually uh, in by some measures more like the professional experience for anyone these days too. We are all in our bedrooms and remote locations, most of us are. Um, so it's interesting that that same conditions that are different for us are actually um, from a perspective more like the professional conditions our students might ultimately find themselves in or currently find themselves in. Um, we can ask students to engage the whole internet as they respond or seek assurances from that they will not. That's kind of our uh, options as far as how students engage with our examinations. Um, we can acknowledge that they have an open internet, open book, or we can, on their honor, ask them to restrict themselves from that access. Uh, of course, we have no direct assurances of the latter, um, but those are the conditions in which we find ourselves in. So the important things to keep in mind that the instructor controls in all this, I mentioned the things we don't control, there are many things we do control. We, the instructor uh, or the department set the learning outcomes, identified the grade weighting, and was in control of almost everything that was added to this course or part of this course up until the moment of examination. The instructor also controls the assessment content, the format, the duration, and grading policies. So even though we no longer have a shared gymnasium for these examinations, um, there are lots that uh, we do share and there's lots that are remain within the instructor's control even in these new conditions. So as I go through the options here on our toolbox of assessment tools at Brock, I want to highlight these three things to remember because they apply to all of our options. It's really important to communicate expectations to students. Um, so one of them I like to highlight is, are there issues for the students on their end? Um, important to communicate in advance if students should, number one, be alerting them, you to them, and number two, how, especially when we think about scaled uh, assessments. If there is an issue, um, how, how would students reach out to you? Um, what kind of uh, information would you want to collect? Important to be clear about that before an incident. Uh, and if uh, in the unfortunate situation where there is an incident, students know what their options are. And that is likely the same way they contact you for anything else in the course, but again, Clear communication is important here. Also important to be clear about how you respond to unexpected events. Um, it'd be uh, important to let students know what kinds of affordances there might be or might not be for students related technical uh, impediments on their end. Um, the situation where that might arise is hard to identify, but it, we can make plans for how we might address those or not in their event. And I always like to think about suggesting that students be able to visualize the examination process. Now, not all students need to visualize the examination process, but I'm asking instructors, if you give students the information that they could use to visualize the examination process, you'll be at your desk, you'll be in Sakai, or it won't be, it'll be multiple choice, or it won't be. If you've communicated that information to students, then they have a good expectation set for how they're going to undertake this assessment. They don't need to actually sit down and visualize it, but if you've communicated everything, all the information that you have to a student to visualize what their new examination context is, then they will be able to anticipate potential issues, ideally, and address them, and hopefully uh, begin this assessment process under less stress or concern than they otherwise might. The other thing I want to highlight of, of the three things is the importance of practice. That goes right along with the idea that students should be able to visualize things. It's important to set up low stakes or practice conditions for students to be assessed in a similar format to how you ultimately want to examine them so that they can be uh, ready for that process. They can anticipate uh, any issues. And if you are going to expect an outcome from a students, students can be assured uh, that they can meet that outcome or take the steps they need to take in order to meet that outcome. So if you are assessing students in a way that re requires a camera, scanning, or other kinds of media tasks, 
Uh, it's really important to make sure students can achieve those tasks before in a practice condition. And then when the examination starts, any potential barriers have been removed and students are familiar with their options. A lot of what we ask students to do in everyday life, they are able to do them simply because they're familiar with them. There are no issues. It's when we encounter new experiences that we can often encounter issues, especially with technology. So practice and low stakes opportunities uh, are important to address those early. And then the last of the three things I want you to consider across all of our options is constructive alignment. Are you what was taught in the course uh, and identify learning outcomes? And will a student that has demonstrated this knowledge understand the, con the course be successful and rely on that knowledge when they're assessed? Or are they going to be relying mostly on their test taking abilities? And certainly that's not our intent, but sometimes the tools manifest this way. Uh, if a student knows that uh, the answer is always C or the longest uh, option is often the correct option, that's a skill, but we would prefer that students are being assessed on their knowledge of the topic and achieving uh, success in their responses based on that knowledge. So as you construct your assessment, it's important to make sure that that's what's being tested, not a student's individual test smarts. So those are the three things, uh, communications, uh, practice and constructive alignment that I want you to consider across all of our options. So what are our options? I shared in the chat a link to the decision tree that I'm showing you right now and uh, the link to the web page that should have it on it. We'll make that sh sure it definitely is in the end. But here are the assessment options at Brock University based on our current toolbox and their most likely use. So starting up the top left, as an instructor, uh, I recommend asking yourself, should the exam script be unique to each student? So if the exam script needs to be unique to each student, then that probably means the Sakai Test and Quizzes tool is the best option for a course with unique uh, scripts for each student. It gives you the option to uh, randomize the position of distractors and questions. So if you only have 50 questions and they're all multiple choice, you can make sure that the positions of A, B, C, and D change for each student. Additionally, you can construct more than 50 questions and ensure that the sequence of those 50 questions are randomized for each student. And that further, if you construct a 75 question, then each student gets a subset of 50, making sure that students have a unique script and should students be tempted to uh, collaborate in a way that they aren't intended to in this examination, then the effort they have to put into collaboration is much higher and hopefully it returned. If the uniqueness of the exam script is not a priority, um, then the next question I would ask is, should grading be automated? If grading needs to be automated, similar to a Scantron or simply for scale, then uh, next question would be, if I have to automate my assessment, can I assess students through multiple choice, true and false, short answer, other questions like matching and similar uh, tools that we have in our Sakai tests and quizzes or other options? If that's the case, then we're back up at using Sakai's test and quizzes tool, and I'll definitely discuss a lot of options with tests and quizzes. If multiple choice and true false cannot uh, assess what are the learning outcomes of this course are or the modalities in which students are asked to respond, then it's worth considering other tools. Uh, if it's a long written response is what we're seeking from students, then the assignments tool, a PDF or Word document submitted to the assignments tool might be the best way to collect that, mark that. Similarly, if students are generating uh, files from a piece of software, if you're working in SPSS, uh, SAS, or um, other uh, computer programming software where an outcome of uh, files is uh, what's being turned in, GIS course, for example, then again, the assignments tool might make the most sense. If the response is more visual, uh, if the student needs to label a diagram or uh... Mike, we lost. C can't hear you. 
<laughs> I, I felt myself press the mute button. Thank you, Norbic. Um, if a student needs to respond to something uh, more visual, mark up a graph, or use scientific or math notation, then a new tool at Brock uh, called CrowdMark might be the best option. I'll cover that as well. That allows us to give students something like a diagram to label and then turn that in uh, as an image and we can assess it there. So that's ending up in uh, all three of our options here. There's a couple other scenarios where uh, if I need grading um, to be automated, if the time limit is important, then often tests and quizzes tool is the best tool to be uh, administering uh, varied or strict time limits. But this is generally a good way to begin to start with what questions, or what kind of a, a exam script do I need to generate, and then what tools I would perhaps use. That said, I think there's nothing wrong with having a tool that you're familiar with here and working backwards from that and understanding what it's capable of. So we shared that uh, decision tree in the chat. It'll be in the recording and in the link afterwards. And of course, if you can't reach out to the CPI, this is, as you describe your course, the kinds of things that members of the CPI will be considering as we respond. So I want to talk about CrowdMark as it might be the simplest one to explain and the one that you may not be familiar with at the moment. Thanks to a special allocation from the provost for this year when we don't have access to our physical drop boxes, we have access to a digital Dropbox and most importantly, a digital grading uh, path in the form of CrowdMark. So the way CrowdMark works is the instructor prepares homework or a test. They construct questions in the CrowdMark interface, either by attaching a PDF or making the questions uh, one by one inside the uh, CrowdMark interface. They can sync up the CrowdMark site with the Sakai site to get student enrollment. Students get a message telling them they need to respond to an assessment. They go in the crowd mark, they see the questions, and they'll get prompted to attach a file or take a picture, and then ultimately submit that assessment. And on the instructor side, they can grade that assessment all digitally. And you can even see in this uh, particular uh, picture that a scan or a smartphone picture has been used to take uh, this mathematical notation, digitize it, and the instructor is giving feedback based on what was submitted. So from a student experience, I'll just uh, begin this playing uh, as I talk more about it once I dismiss my markup tool. Press escape. So from a student experience, what they would do in uh, in the process experience or the ultimate examination, go to CrowdMark, see their assessment. In this case, we have someone, uh, me, who's printed the assessment in advance, marked it up, and is ready to submit. On, in this case, on their smartphone, take a picture, attach it, and press submit. Students can do this with their smartphone. Students can do this all digitally if they happen to have a tablet or other digital workflow that works for them. Um, CrowdMark expects an outcome. And, and thus allow students to find the path that works best for them, which is also why practice is very important. On the instructor experience side, I'll advance through this. Instructor creates their assessment in the CrowdMark interface and delivers that to their students. Actually, I'm going to move on one more slide. And then when the student submissions are actually uh, submitted, the instructor and their marking team can uh, mark up those submissions, give it a grade, return that mark back to the student. Um, anything the student can take a picture of, scan, turn into a PDF, they can submit. And thus, if we need them to do scientific or mathematical notation, mark up a diagram or a graph, or create a graph, we can do that. I know uh, from personal experience and experience of other instructors we've worked with, it's frustrating when uh, the assessment you want to have uh, constructed involves more instructions about using things like PowerPoint or Canva or anything else than the actual subject matter uh, assessment instructions. Something like CrowdMark lets you uh, 
just tell students, take a picture and submit it. And on the marking side, there's no incompatibilities, et cetera, with the images or loose files. You get this nice interface of feedback. So that's the first of the three tools. We talked about the kinds of decisions that might lead you to one of these three tools. The next tool I want to talk about is Sakai's test and quizzes tool. I wanted to pause if that prompted any questions that people might want to share in the chat or aloud about the kinds of decisions you might make about what assessment to use, something that seeing that paper-based crowdmark experience might have prompted for you, or other questions you might have thus far. So if you want to add a question in the chat, raise the hand, unmute. See Mark share their notes for today, which is great, and the decision tree. Tests and quizzes is a, a very powerful, very and also very complicated. So I want to uh, give everyone a chance to ask questions they might have about um, how one ends up using these platforms for exams, or even just crowdmark before we get into the complexity that is the test and quizzes tool generally. That said, any one person's use of test and quizzes can be quite simple. Uh, the challenge is finding your use for test and quizzes and uh, your familiar space within that complexity. That's, I think, the challenge of test and quizzes overall. OK. Test and quizzes allows us to deliver assessments to students that um, can be drawn from a question pool, uh, can have a time limit. We can make sure that we have unique assessments for each student or common ones. Fully inter integrated in Sakai and the gradebook, it can be linked to from other tools. Brock University regularly deliver delivers large assessments through the test and quizzes tool. And it's not on by default in a Sakai course, but site info managed tools allows you to add the test and quizzes tool. So the main test and quizzes tool interface, and if, if you have a, um, a sample course, dummy course, or other course that you want to look at, you could welcome to follow along. You won't be moving uh, slow enough for you to construct with me, but you're welcome to look at these various parts with us. In the test and quizzes tool, we've got a couple of tabs across the top, updated for Sakai 19, uh, the add button, which we'll look at in a moment as we construct a uh, assessment through its settings, the actual assessments page where we have concepts of draft and publish, the assessment types, which are set, question pools. An instructor can have a set of question pools, which I mentioned can be drawn from in any one assessment and also be uh, used across their courses in Sakai. You can uh, deliver a good orientation uh, qu quiz, turn that into a pool, and then bring that to your other course. You can refine a pool of questions from year to year. Uh, you, and you can share your pools per site with other instructors in that site. We have an event log, which is important for understanding what happens with our assessment uh, ongoing. And a user, user activity report. Plus, if you uh, remove a assessment and need to recover it, there's a trash. Maybe recycling is going to be more important, but I think the use is clear. So I want to uh, give you some tips about what can help understanding how the test and quizzes tool works because within all those uh, options again complexity but there could be a simple familiar path for anyone using it i always give the advice to consider duration before dates and times so what i mean by that is there's an option to set a time limit typically two hours or three hours in brock university uh, some of the exams and you'll get a time assigned from the registrar for exams. Uh, I recommend uh, setting time outside of the fixed duration for a number of reasons. So if I have a two hour uh, exam, then I'll set my time limit for two hours. I may even set my availability for uh, if it was scheduled for 7 p.m. I may set for 6.55 p.m. And if it's a two hour duration, I may set my uh, 
and the availability time as late as uh, 9.30 or maybe even 10. Because the important thing for us in this assessment is it is a two-hour duration. Um, we want to make sure that two hours is all the time that students get unless they have an exemption. But uh, the way that the web works, when they click that link is when they actually start. So you want to make sure that the students have a moment to navigate to that page, to refresh the page, to see the link, um, and other potential issues they may have along the way. Um, we don't want students to be uh, denied amount of time simply because they misnavigated or took a little extra time with their password, especially when we consider multi-factor authentication becoming a new thing at Brockford University. The, the other side at the end of that is, if a student were to start at, in our scenario, uh, 7.05, we're only going to give them two hours. But if we had the closing date at 9 p.m., Sakai is going to only accept what was saved up until 9 p.m. And unless we give them extra time. So that student would, in effect, be given an hour and 55 minutes, not the two hours we intended. And I would suggest that the time that may have taken them to navigate towards that start point uh, really isn't part of their assessment. We wanted them to be assessed for two hours. So by setting that duration to give some grace time at the end for students that may not have clicked and likely haven't clicked at the exact second the assessment became available is both important for making sure students get a fair chance. And I will say from experience, um, minimizes the number of issues you could have with students ongoing in an exam. So think duration and then think about time limits that will nicely and uh, safely fit that duration. Students can start an examination at any point during that availability. So obviously you wouldn't, uh, we all think there should be consequences for a student that starts two hours late. Um, but at the same time, it's much easier to uh, allow for that five minute late start that only got two hours to submit versus um, having to deal with consequences of, inf of uh, a submission that was technically blocked when otherwise we'd like to accept it. So think duration over start dates. Think duration first, then pick your dates. Um, the other thing to consider is once an assessment is published in Sakai, there is very little that can be changed. So if it, the scoring of a question was uh, incorrect, there was a typo, uh, there was a slip of the mouse when the questions were uh, authored. There isn't much we can do once that quiz is published. There are some things we can do retroactively, but be prepared that once a quiz is published, it is in that state. So if midway through the examination, students identify that um, it says respond to all of the above, but you chose the random position, so all of the above is the top option, um, unfortunately, you'll have to live with that and address it after the assessment. There isn't anything we can do to modify those kinds of things in assessment once published. So I'll talk about building your assessment in tests and quizzes, but again, if this prompts any questions or comments, you're welcome to raise your hand, play something in the chat, or grab the mic. As you're building a test and quizzes tool, there's two primary routes to construct your questions. So on the left here is the familiar assessment builder, which is ultimately the tool that is used for creating things in tests and quizzes. It allows you to build calculated questions, have file uploads, fill in the blank, hotspot selection, uh, matching options, multiple choice, numeric responses, a short answer or essays, an audio recording, uh, survey Likert style, a survey matrix style, true, false, and then the options from the pool. That's where you'll get the most question type options. On the right here is an alternative uh, affordance that I really like in Sakai. You can create using markup text, which only supports multiple choice, fill in the blank, short essay, true, false, and uh, uh, numeric fill in the blank. But you can construct the questions in a much more natural language method in Microsoft Word, for example, or copy an old exam script, follow these markup guidelines. You can see in this little example here, 
you follow its guidelines, it can identify that text, spot that those are indeed multiple choice or fill in the blank questions. And then build an assessment in the regular test and quizzes tool with the regular uh, interface that you ultimately have to use for creating assessments. But that can be a nice uh, quick start for building assessments in Sakai that markup text. Type it all out, lay out your questions in the uh, format that it will prompt you to here on the right. Press create, and you've got a bunch of questions created in this format already. So as I mentioned, there are 12 question types supported by Sakai's test and quizzes tool. Um, each question should have a point value. Remember to set it. It's, it is going to be blank by default. And one of those challenges you can have in a delivered assessment, if you deliver an assessment with a question is worth zero, you'll have to do something corrective after it's delivered. Be sure you select the correct response if you're expecting one. And uh, a good tip is there's the option to randomize answers in multiple choice so that the correct answer and the distractors are all in different positions for each different student. Um, it's easy to check that box. The only real complication is you can't use all of the above, none of the above. You can have different languages such as all options are correct, no options are correct because positioning moves. But otherwise, um, randomizing that answer position uh, ensures that students are looking for the correct answer, not looking for the correct position. Speaking of ways to make things more dynamic for students, we have some dynamic functionality in Sakai's questions. The uh, ability to do those question pools and draw from them is a clear example of this. Um, if you're capable of creating a large, you can have multiple tool pools you're drawing from from different sections, that's helpful. You can also use uh, numeric responses where the response is a number between a range. Taking that even further, you can have calculated questions, which introduces a number of variables where not only is the response going to be dynamic, but the construction of the question is as well, uh, right down to a formula. So in this example, Kevin has X apples, he buys Y more. Now Kevin has X plus Y, J, Z apples. Kevin now has uh, W apples. We can, because of the way we've set this up with those, which the uh, Sakai interface will explain as you construct your calculated questions. We're asking our respondent to uh, fill in how many apples Kevin now has. And the construction up to that point, make sure that uh, each student will get different values between for X, 1 and 6, Y, 2 and 6, and Z, 1 and 6 again with no decimal places. So asking students to respond to a, a calculated question with dynamic variables. For each assessment inside Sakai's Test and Quizzes, they'll have the following options to edit the questions, uh, preview it, which is a very helpful step that I recommend before you publish anything, print, so you can make a PDF of the exam script, likely for archival reasons today, but I know that uh, that has been used for a number of purposes, including accommodations in the past. The settings, which we'll go through in a moment, the publish option to take a draft and move it to the publish state where uh, dates permitting students can actually see it and it'll have an entry in the gradebook if you choose that. Duplicate for construction and export for moving between uh, uh, different contexts, maybe inside Sakai. You can even export in formats that are compatible with other LMSs. But uh, the tools you'll be using the most of those actions are edit, settings, and then likely publish at some point. I'm going to go through the settings. These are the longest list of complex options in Sakai's tests and quizzes. Um, good to think about how these may particularly impact the assessment you might be considering, because um, there are, again, a lot of options, but a, a familiar path should be there for everyone. So I'm going through each item here. Uh, the in what the, the UI people would call an accordion. The first accordion area is uh, about availability and submissions, expectations, time limits, and delivery date, exceptions, barring. 
<laughs> time list and delivery dates, grading and feedback, and the layout and appearance. So about just includes the title and an optional description. This is also where you can require an honor pledge, which will have students uh, check off that they have either given or received any unacknowledged assistance with the assessment. They're doing everything a checkbox can do to promote integrity. In the availability and submission, this is the area I was referring to earlier. So it can be released to a subgroup or the entire site, typically the entire site. How many attempts students get in the context of exams? It's typically only one attempt, but there are other options, of course. Our first option there is its availability date. When is it available? Right here. And then when is it due? But I always recommend consider the time limit first. So if this is intended to be a three hour exam, set to three hours. And then I'd recommend availability and due dates that can accommodate uh, perhaps students showing up early and wanting to get going with a minute or two at your discretion. But most importantly, a due date that if a student doesn't make it there at the exact second it comes available, they can still get their two or three hour window to submit. So minutes, if not tens or even a full hour's worth of uh, time after the time limit will expire. So if a student starts mi minutes, tens of minutes, whatever, after the actual availability date, they can still get the full uh, time limit we intended for them. Or uh, less or so as appropriate. This also applies to late submissions. That's our ultimate final date. Um, so they can the students can press start up until the due date. The last moment they submit is the due date, but they can press start until the due date. And related, by default, the auto submit student work after the last acceptance date is checked. You can uncheck that, but I would strongly recommend you keep it. Uh, this is going to ensure that if students never press submit for grading at the end of the assessment, Sakai will collect it at that last date. Similarly, if students uh, get interrupted or otherwise navigate away from the assessment, the in-progress work will be submitted at the end. It often adds nothing to our examination process to have students actually press the submit for grading option at the very end. If they've responded to every single question, it's uh, almost always better to assess what they responded to versus reject everything. So the auto submit there is just in case students don't get to that very last spot of answering the, their final response, and then pressing submit for grading, that auto submit will make sure it's collected and given to instructors to grade. There's also some email options there, but they aren't as important as other items. So there's a those dates uh, put in sharper focus. Uh, beneath that is the exemptions of time limits and delivery dates. So in accordance with the instructions you may get from SAS, Student Accommodation Services, uh, this is where you can add in students and their uh, exceptions to those dates you already set. This is often a duration exemption. So if a student has 1.5 or two times the amount of time, let's say they have twice the amount of time on a two hour exam, then you would select that individual student from the list here, set a time limit in our two hour exam to give them four hours, and then further set dates that can uh, accommodate four hours. So it's available around the same time as the rest of the students, but we have to really consider that due date and late submission time, late submission being most important here. Of if they take, uh, if they start their four hours at five minutes past, let's make sure in that late submission or due date we can accommodate that. Um, because uh, otherwise they'll get truncated, otherwise they'll inherit the default date for other students. And if, it, if you don't set a late submission that can accommodate the, the student's extra time, their extra time will not be afforded to them and they'll be cut off at the otherwise due date. So we add an exemption for a student, think time limit first, then think about the availability dates to complement that. You can add them in sequence. You can also construct group-based exemptions, though a lot of caution goes there. Um, 
There are ways to disclose those groups to the roster tool if you're not careful. And secondly, uh, you have to remember that if a student is a member of multiple groups, the last exemption in the list is the one that applies to them. But otherwise, um, you get a combination notice for a student in your course. You have an exam in Sakai's tests and quizzes tool, exemptions and time limit, pick their name, give them their likely duration extension, and pick that dates to match, add exemption. So here's what adding an actual exemption would work for your one student. We already have one set here. We've picked another student, setting their time limit first, adding their dates, add exemption. Beneath that in our accordion here is grading and feedback. Uh, if there's multiple su submissions, uh, which score is kept is important. We can optionally hide the identity from the grader of student submissions. We can optionally send the mark to the gradebook. This does send the mark immediately. So if you're using an assessment that's automatically scored, which you likely are, uh, the moment a student hits submit, that will be on the gradebook. So some instructors like to not check this option uh, initially, review submissions, and then change the settings to send things off to the gradebook. This certainly isn't a requirement, but if you do want to Review all submissions before students know what their numeric grade is before they get feedback. Um, you might want to check that button later, but this is what controls sending the numeric grade off to the gradebook. Beneath that is the feedback, question level or section level. Uh, usually question level is what everyone wants. When will the feedback be shown? By default, students will get no feedback for their examination, not even being able to see what they submitted, and certainly not what was correct. To show students feedback, you can have it set to be immediate as soon as they press submit. As soon as they answer the question, actually, so as they're navigating through the assessment, they can actually go backwards and say, oh, here's my answer. Probably doesn't work in the examination context. What might work in an examination context is feedback on submission. But uh, don't forget that students are going to take varying amounts of times to submit this. Um, what is likely most appropriate in the examination condition is feedback will be displayed to the students on a specific date. Give yourself some time to uh, work through the submissions. You can, of course, suggest this if you need more time, but I would not set this date to be immediately after the last availability. I would set that date to be something that complements your regular marking uh, workflow. And at that point, students can uh, see whatever submission you intend for them. So the options here, uh, that typically are chosen are things like show students how they responded and likely what the correct response would be. And you can also choose to show students their scores on each question. So again, no feedback by default. You can choose to give feedback and when you give it. And even then, once you choose to give feedback, you have to actually choose which items students are going to see. It does not show students what they submitted by default. You need to check off student responses and then you likely want to add correct responses and student assessment scores. Almost through these settings here. A uh, couple more options here, uh, the layout and appearance. By default, uh, it will be set to random access to questions from a table of contents. I always like to highlight that that is the kind of engineering definition of random. So students won't necessarily be randomly uh, dropped a different question in your assessment. It means that they have random access to go back to a table of contents or navigate left and right to the questions in the assessment. It's not that they go from question one to 17 to 12. It's that they have the ability, if they choose, to go from one to 17 to 12. Otherwise, it goes one, two, three, four, five. Um, it also defaults that each question is on a separate web page, so one question at a time. This has the advantage that students will be pressing the buttons for previous, next, and save, and ultimately submit for grading more often. Sakai will store students' responses every time they press one of those buttons, previous, next, and save. So if a student were to be interrupted in the middle of their assessment, if their Wi-Fi goes down, their battery dies, um, other things unpredicted occur, they can within their time limits, time, yeah, time limit and availability, log back in and pick up their assessment. 
or if we never hear from them again, it will auto submit. But if you give students all 50 questions on one page, um, there's a good chance that if it gets interrupted at question 49, we've lost everything. If you give students one or a separate part on those pages, every time a student hits previous or next, Sakai is saving it. They can pick that up back up if they get interrupted. We'll submit that on their behalf if time runs out. So they can press save on that same 50 question layout, um, but to maximize natural uh, saving of that, having one question per page, make sure that Sakai has their responses saved. And that is it for the actual settings. If that prompted any questions for I don't know how that would work, I don't understand the practicalities of that setting, I'm welcome to make some questions in the chat. Um, I'll move on to grading because that's, of course, the natural next step. And I'm cognizant of our time. But uh, lots of settings. Again, a familiar path is waiting for everyone. The grading interface uh, by default is only accessible by instructors, not TAs. The assigned TA option will allow you to get a TA access to test inclusives, which I acknowledge is not intuitive. Um, often instructors will promote, promote TAs to the instructor role just to ensure they have access, but it's worth knowing that there is no access for TAs without the assigned TA or a role promotion in the course to actually. So you can grade the student submissions by question or by the whole submission. Grading by question uh, can help uh, instructors focus on one response if they need to um, do actual manual grading or uh, address any issues or verify uh, that the automated grading was done correctly. You can go into your submissions, questions, question one, two, three, four, et cetera, and then see all the student responses for that particular question. So here's another example here. If that, could, if that was a short answer, that might be a part where the uh, system, Sakai, will mark you all your uh, initial questions, and then the marking team might go to the final question in that assessment and then mark a, a written response, for example. Alternatively, you can go through uh, student by student submissions and see an individual student's response to all questions. So if there's a visual uh, perspective, you can Click one student, work uh, vertically on their response, or work horizontally on one question, all students. Both are options. Both grades will ultimately go against the final, uh, the score for that response, that student. I see Karen constructing a, a comment, which I'm looking forward to. Other options inside the uh, scores or the grades area is things like item analysis. I won't go too much into this, but Sakai does offer item analysis for your questions. You're looking for a high discrimination value. So what we want to know is, does any one question do a good job of discriminating between high performing students across the rest of the assessment and low performing students across the rest of the assessment? Questions should uh, demonstrate that students who do well in the assessment overall do well in that question. Students that do poorly on the assessment overall do poorly on that question. We want a number like one for their discrimination value. Here's a much larger set here with a, a 19,015 students' responses. You can see the discrimination values are much less clear cut. But again, we want to know if, if the question is performing well, it's going to uh, discriminate between those overall responses. And if the question has a very low discrimination value, it could require your attention in that assessment. So, uh, and I'm speaking from personal experience, did I actually identify the correct response to this multiple choice or did I misidentify it? A good signal there. And also you may affect if you want to reuse a question type, if it is a poor discriminator. So that is the test and quizzes tool. Um, very complicated, but also a familiar path for everyone. Uh, I recommend uh, reaching out to the CPI once you have thoughts on how you want to construct your assessment. And um, there is a uh, to make tests and quizzes like tool do what you are thinking about doing. It just takes uh, 
some orientation, but once you know what that path is, hopefully it's familiar. I'm going to take a moment to read uh, Karen's comment in the chat. So Karen's mentioned that she's concerned about students, um, that she wants her students to get the feedback on the responses they gave. But uh, if she were to reuse those questions in another context, now the students that answered the first time have some easy access to the question construction and uh, the correct answer. Uh, I think it's a good point. The In some cases, instructors only release a score for the assessment. Um, and in those contexts, it's much easier to uh, infer from a student what they got right or wrong. Um, but um, the uh, challenges with the, the withholding that information is um, that uh, students won't be able to make meaning of what they responded to, and it could be left with a misconception. Um, others have any strategies for how you can uh, both give students that immediate feedback and protect what might be a question you want to use in the future. One thing that occurs to me is, of course, uh, we have a lot of questions or a lot of examination scripts on file with the library. Um, and students have access to those. It's a similar kind of situation. Um, one might consider this in the construction of their questions, and it might be simple enough that uh, simple variations in a construction of a question, if the house was red, it can turn into being blue, might be enough so that students are trying to remember the meaning, the uh, correct response, the knowledge behind the question versus the literal response. Um, Margaret's asking about the idea of turn in. Uh, last thing we'll talk about is Sakai's assignments tool, which does have turn in integration. That's certainly one of its distinguishers between the tests and quizzes tool, um, but the tests and quizzes tool does not have turn in integration. So, in the interest of time, uh, I'm going to move on to the assignments tool, but certainly we can uh, uh, revisit these discussions both in the chat ongoing and at the end as well. Last tool. Our assignments tool. Uh, if you haven't created an assignment in Sakai, uh, this is what the grading interface looks like. You get a timestamp for everything students submitted, a status of submitted or not, and of course their names and the artifacts they submit. So Sakai's uh, assignments tool has a benefit of being well controlled. Instructor and student share a uh, submission status. Students get a submission receipt. Um, we get reports, not just the originality report that comes from turn in if you choose to use it and you've informed your students that you're using it. Um, we also can get uh, submission statuses for uh, who submit, who hasn't very immediately um, on those nice lists that can create. Permit, unlike tests and quizzes, easy to give TAs uh, permissions. You can even give uh, the organizer role extra permissions if you have something like a course coordinator who does or market versus market graders so you can kind of delineate between position permissions there and at a glance test and quizzes to or the, the assignments tool gives us a great uh up to moment status of submitted unsubmitted graded ungraded and the feedback's released or not this is what the grading experience can look like uh, for an instructor so we've got a turn in report which we can uh, I'll go back to the main page to launch in the greater feedback area of turn in. We've got a file here that we can download to start reviewing. And as a marker grader or TA, I could add my comments in that file in this box to be given back to their students. There's a spot for a grade here of 100. I can also, again, download this particular Word file, um, mark that up in Microsoft Word, reattach it, send it back here and give students back some feedback for that submission. The assignments tool also has concepts of dates. They're much more simplified to the test and quizzes tool. 
Open date, the first day students can click on it and see it. Due date, when, when it is due and all submissions after that will be marked as late. And how late will we accept them on the accept until date? Uh, there are no direct accommodations options in assignment. So if students do get additional time, you'll have to accommodate that in the accept uh, until date and then use those late flags to be able to sort by date to identify if the student is entitled to this extra time or uh, may be falling afoul of the late penalties associated with your course. So that's the assignment tool again. A simpler tool takes artifacts like documents, can give you things like training reports, um, typically used with longer of amounts of time. Options for grade status, which is really useful for uh, working in grading teams. So if your TAs, market graders are doing uh, grading, you can see the status being updated and graded and a grade appear and also released. Uh, typically, instructors get control over release and market graders can only uh, submit the actual grade feedback, but the instructor can choose to release all or manually release. And there's options like after the uh, assessment is done, it's easy to zero out students that didn't submit. So that is our three main tools, uh, CrowdMark, Sakai Tests and Quizzes, and Assignments. Um, lots to consider in constructing your examination within these tools. I can see some questions uh, coming in now in the chat, and Mark and Norbert can be in response to them. I'm going to cast my eyes to the chat and uh, see if we have any raised hands. But most importantly, I think uh, keep in mind the CPI is here to help you with this uh, exam construction. It often is helpful after a very successful uh, exam construction in Sakai to email EdTech at Brock and to simply summarize, this is what I think I created. Would you mind taking a look and confirming this is what I created? Uh, and of course, any step before that point, we're happy to help with as well. Asha asked about a uh, time limit for each question. Unfortunately, there isn't an option for a time limit for each question. There's only those limits across the whole assessment. It's an um, a important consideration. Um, there are ways to chain multiple assessments together. They come with risks of the fact that you're chaining multiple assessments together. I have actually delivered such an assessment in a lab, um, which had the benefit of being in a lab. But there are techniques to um, have students have a certain amount of time on a whole separate assessment and then move on to the next. Um, if that's something that interests you, edtech at brocky.ca, we can tell you some strategies for that. Um, but otherwise, you are constrained, uh, or students aren't constrained um, by the assessment time limit across the entire assessment. I see Norbert answered that already. Uh, I'm, I think I already spied and responded to you about worth uh, summarizing and commenting again that Margaret asked about uh, most of those questions in the final exam being short answer and can they be run to turn in. Uh, that might be a moment where you consider uh, is it easier to do this assessment through the assignments tool where I do get a turn in report. If you have uh, multiple, uh, let's say three major questions with written responses, maybe an ass assignment that gives a prompt of the three questions and asking for a file to be uploaded that can get a report on is the best format for that exam. Lots more to consider in that, but that's something uh, I would suggest is something to evaluate. Uh, Argy also answered, but questions randomized in the part, can the part also be randomized? Good question. They cannot. Um, you can isolate the randomization to those parts. So. If I built a question pool uh, of 10 questions and I want to randomize five for part one, I can do that. For part two, I can randomize that as well. Uh, some instructors will even have many parts across their assessment, even uh, situations where question one drawn from five, question two drawn from five. And those variations can actually be quite trivial in that model because um, you don't have to worry about the pool having more than one drawn from it. So my trivial example of a color of a building changing isn't that bad if you only are drawing one, but of course it'd be a big deal if you're drawing two. 
But it's a good question if you can randomize the sequence of parts. Unfortunately, you cannot. You can certainly do, as Karen's asking, a longer uh, question uh, at the end of multiple choice. Um, uh, if there's two separate time limits, I mentioned that that might be addressed through two separate tests and quizzes, though with the complications that might bring with it. Um, but uh, otherwise, it's certainly possible to have a dozen multiple choice at the start and a big, uh, well-considered written response at the end. And that question marking could help with that. Um, the, the general idea that the test and quizzes tool is tuned for these more discrete short responses than these long responses, no turning report being an example, um, may be a factor in how you construct that. But um, you're certainly asking an interesting question. And um, hopefully, uh, through this session and follow up you might do with the CPI, you can consider what your options might be there and the best path. So knowing that's 11 and uh, we all have other things to do today, I'm going to give you all a, a polite opportunity to move on to what else you might have to do. Um, myself and others from CPI will remain in the chat. Um, we are always here at edtech at rocky.ca to respond to questions about constructing exams. And um, we will be offering this uh, workshop again. But more importantly, the resources are available in the link shared earlier, and I'll drop it in the chat again. And uh, Good luck with your examinations and your continued success in these unique conditions we all find ourselves in.